quick story, man. Uh, at the time, right when I was evolving, uh, I made the deal with all the record shots out to be no limit. That guy been doing well as he you know, um, coming out the concentration camp and all the C-Lope records at the time. We put together for the last thing that we had do that in time in life. But in the midst of recording my first album, Balls of My Word, I was doing what I was doing streetwise and otherwise, and I had like two jobs that I used to go to. Got on site in the morning time, and I worked pizza late at night, and I go to the studio after that. So you know, I, at, a, at a point, I was extremely exhausted coming home from work and trying to get the pizza hut uh, for like five in the evening. I was construction site at 4:35 o'clock, and when I made it to the job, my manager was understood. So you know, if I was really late, they didn't mind. But long story short. I used to have a 65 Cadillac that I used to drive. And um, I, I used to call it Cadillac. It was my back one. It was a top top. It got, you know, the rain was just that guy's arm. I used to um, I used to the front of where I couldn't see behind me unless I had the top drops. So definitely on rainy days, I couldn't do that. But, again, long story short, I'm on my way to Pizza Hut. I'm coming from work, and I fell asleep in that car. And due to the fact that I had a median to my left, traffic to my right, you know, in some kind of mysterious, mythical way, the car went left instead of right, and bounced off the curb and woke me back up. I was about five minutes behind the car the job. So once I got to work, he told me I looked at that exhaust and I could take the night off and go home. But all I could think about was me going into the peak of my career. I still look up to guys like Rock him to the DOC, and I remember the DOC being number one in the world, and ain't no telling what hip hop would be to this day. If he wouldn't have had um, the accident that he, that he had in just his voice. I always looked at that, and I always followed the guy. Um, shots out to Roddy P out there in Dallas, man. When I met him, I said, man, I call you the clear, clear engineer. Take a guy that don't have a voice and give him a voice, but he still did that. He helped us the record. He didn't have the projection that he had or his overall vocab, but his lyrical display and everything, and it's still the record that I listened to. So, um, with that in mind, you know, going through those different times, um, the car was a 65, so it was a lot of reincarnated thoughts when you're talking Malcolm in the 60s and all that type of thing. So all that kind of went through my brain, um, all the people, the fallen soldiers, and the path of prophets is not here no more, and I kind of coincided into one thing. Um, and not so directly as the um, Ghost Rider comic book um, and the movie definitely wasn't out at the time, but it was just my assumption um, after the death of Pac and picking up and say um, I'm on my own record on where the other boy left off. You know what I mean? So growing right to that 22 years old, priority record, right around the corner where, where Biggie was murdered. You know what I mean? I signed, I was, you know, I was in California three months after the death of Big, signing with priority that June of 97. So all that kind of impacted and, um, created the, um, the atmosphere for what Ghost Rider became. Just that saying I'm keeping it mad on you, know? Yeah, the beat could Hell of a song. You know, yes, when, sir, when, um, when you put that out, you know what I'm saying, um, was that was that one of the, everybody's favorites off the album? Still to this day, that's some people's favorites. You know, everybody got their picks and choosers, but that's definitely one of them. Absolutely. Cool. What did Pete think of that one? Um, we never talked about it directly. When I turned in the record with P, it's three still undiscovered and unreleased records that I had that we substituted for three beats by the pound or two beats by the pound track, and one happened to be a pin sheet track, which was Bring the Noise on, on my album. So I gathered those, Bring the Noise, Five So Hard, and Mo Money all in one night, and P was turning in my record the next day. So I turned in like 14 records, and we took three off to add. You know, um, that beats by the pound texture to it. So, you know what I mean? Keep in mind, you know, um, no limit was no limit, and we still was the camp. So we were working in and out of each other, but we had our own thing in that sense. So, you know, away from them, I stayed working, like I said, two jobs, and I, you know, go to the studio at the end of the night and work on that record. And, you know, when it came out, that was the outcome. But we never talked directly in particular about no song. I just felt like he loved the record. As a matter of fact, I'll tell you a short mouthpiece story, man. Uh, I had a 
song in the street that still hasn't been released that was called Balls in My Word that we didn't put on the album. And um, what P had got one of that title when I believe and started promoting my album as Balls in My Word before I really knew it. So by the time we talked about it, I really wanted to call my album um, and offer you can't you can't refuse off the Godfather Cardione thing, trying to be separate from Scarface being right next door running with the whole Tony Montana balls in my word thing. Yeah, it was a song on a ghetto boy record, but it was an instrumental called Balls in My Word long before oh, Scarface. Get ready, red, solo yeah. Album. yeah, yeah, you know, and um rest in peace. You know what I mean? The ready red. red. Yeah. So, you know, in that same sense, yeah, that my whole persona was black hand side cardion, you know what I mean? I took the whole other cardion and put an A in it and made it my own thing. You know what I mean? So yeah, um so like I say, um, P had already was promoting that record like that. And he said from the penitentiary up, I never forget he said that and uh everywhere else he promoted, everybody said it was hardest, you know what I mean? Never touched, but it was hard as hell, you know what I mean? So I went with that format, and it worked for everybody. So it was more like a joint um, venture and a collaborated effort, you know, putting that whole album together between the Concentration Camp, c Loke Ruckers, and No Limit, you know what I mean, and Master P and Priority Ruckers. So, you know, that's the end results of it. Man, that's, uh, that's legendary. So you're saying, though, uh, I know the fans are going to love this, you're saying there's three unreleased tracks out there for, th- that didn't make that album. You heard them since, or they lost them? I hadn't heard them. I hadn't heard them since. If it's anywhere, you know, it might be in the c low vault or something with the camp, but the only song I remember, I forget the, the other two songs, but one was called The Juke, you know what I mean? That I was kind of making a country bass kind of Martin Bay Blue. And how you know the blues men should go to the juke house, and we still had that, and um, you know maybe different parts of the country, but definitely in Mississippi, Louisiana, that type of thing. You know, I've always been a fan of the blues since my granddaddy way back in the gap. So you know, having that southern heritage, I was trying to coincide that with the rap, and it was a cool like, um, you know what I mean? Um, how can I describe it? Uh, Kind of like if you look at the Marvin Gaye picture, whatever, you know, the, the, the Sugar Shack picture, if anybody know that from one of the Marvin Gaye album covers, it was kind of one of those joints. Or uh, I'll give you something more familiar hip hop wise. Um, the Eyes Squad, shout out to Devin Blind Rob, you know what I mean? Rum, the rest of those yeah, guys, just a couple dude, brothers. Yep. You know what I mean? So they first. Fat covered, enough funk for everybody. <laughs> yeah, that, that cover. So it was kind of a jam that'll fit that kind of purpose, you know what I mean? Yeah. Oh yeah. Damn. I hadn't heard it. Yeah, since those times. Yes, sir. I wonder why they were cut. Um. Well, really, like I say, at the time, you know, P was P was like a speedball man. If he was turning the record tomorrow, he was gonna take what's there, and that, that was gonna be the basis of that record. You know, pretty much. Um. So we're having to connect. An indirect connect, you know what I mean? I don't know what was translated while we was, you know, taking care of the business and everything. And not saying that I wasn't with the program, but it happened in that fast amount. And I thought, you know, to the wire that that record, um, the original How You Do That, which was really called The Fool, that was um, released on the, the first self titled Concentration Cap compilation, didn't make my balls and my word due to production and mixing and time frame and all that. So they kind of got caught in that shuffle. Um, so I kind of left it that. The, the wave took off so great. Keep in mind, the world probably saw me like that same summer 97, but I still was unreleased as a solo artist, still working on my balls and my word, or I just turned it in. But it was aimed to be released the following January of 98. So with it coming off the body soundtrack, it was already a big record, so I hit the ground running. But by the time it was time for me to come to play, yeah, you know, it was all suit. So it was pretty much that we narrowed it down to those 14 joints. And, you know, like I said, it was just undeniable. We turned the record in. I didn't get no naysaying from c Loke records to No Limit records on up to Priority records. You know, it wasn't no no. Everything was you know, open auction to me. You know what I mean? So I, you know, ran with the program, which was a beautiful thing. It's still a thing to this day. So, yeah, man, if it wasn't for that, the moves made at the time, you know, I ain't no telling where I'd be and, and what would be happening. But, yeah, you know, um, you know, it's an old saying. They say, if it's not broke, don't fix it. You know what I mean? If it don't fit, you can't force it. 
So everything was smooth selling, so I just, you know, played my position and, and evolved. Basically. Make sure to subscribe to the channel, hit the bell for notifications, like, comment, share. Also go over to UGSForLife.com, download the entire archive, and check out new episodes on Apple Podcasts and Blog Talk Radio.